In late May and early June 1942, during World War II, submarines belonging to the Imperial Japanese Navy made a series of attacks on the Australian cities of Sydney and Newcastle. On the night of the 31st May to the 1st June, three Kohayoteki class midget submarines, each with a two member crew, entered Sydney Harbour, avoided the partially constructed Sydney Harbour anti submarine boom net, and attempted to sink Allied warships. Two of the midget submarines were detected and attacked before they could engage any Allied vessels. The crew of M14 scuttled their submarine, whilst M21 was successfully attacked and sunk. The crew of M21 killed themselves. These submarines were later recovered by the Allies. The third submarine attempted to torpedo the heavy cruiser USS Chicago, but instead sank the converted ferry HMAS Cuttable, killing 21 sailors. This midget submarine's fate was unknown until 2006, when amateur scuba divers discovered the wreck off Sydney's northern beaches. Immediately following the raid, the five Japanese fleet submarines that carried the midget submarines to Australia embarked on a campaign to disrupt merchant shipping in eastern Australian waters. Over the next month, the submarines attacked at least seven merchant vessels, sinking three ships and killing 50 sailors. During this period, between midnight and 2.30 on 8 June, two of the submarines bombarded the ports of Sydney and Newcastle. The midget submarine attacks and subsequent bombardments are among the best-known examples of Axis naval activity in Australian waters during World War II, and are the only occasion in history when either city has come under attack. The physical effects were slight, the Japanese had intended to destroy several major warships, but sank only an unarmed depot ship and failed to damage any significant targets during the bombardments. The main impact was psychological, creating popular fear of an impending Japanese invasion and forcing the Australian military to upgrade defences, including the commencement of convoy operations to protect merchant shipping. Chapter 1 – Forces Chapter 1 – Section 1 – Japanese The Imperial Japanese Navy originally intended to use six submarines in the attack on Sydney Harbour, B-1-type submarines I-21, I-27, I-28, and I-29, and C-1-type submarines I-22 and I-24.161 The six submarines made up the Eastern Attack Group of the 8th Submarine Squadron, under the command of Captain Honkyu Sasaki, 161.59 on 8 June 1942, I-21 and I-29, each carrying a Yokosuka E-14Y1 Glen floatplane for aerial reconnaissance scouted various Australasian harbours to select the ones most vulnerable to attack by midget submarines, 61-163 I-21 scouted Noumea, Suva, then Auckland, while I-29 went to Sydney, 162 on the 11th of May, I-22, I-24, I-27, and I-28 were ordered to proceed to the Japanese naval base at Truck Lagoon, in the Caroline Islands, to each receive a Kohayoteki class midget submarine, 61 I-28 failed to reach truck, she was torpedoed on the surface by the US submarine USS Tatorg on 17 May. 61 to 62 The three remaining submarines left truck around 20 May for a point south of the Solomon Islands, 62 I-24 was forced to return a day later, when an explosion in her midget submarine's battery compartment killed the midget's navigator and injured the commander, 164 The midget submarine intended for I-28 replaced the damaged midget, 164. Chapter 1 Section 2 – Allies The naval officer in charge of Sydney Harbour at the time of the attack was Rear Admiral Gerard Muirhead Gould of the Royal Navy, 30 On the night of the attack, three major vessels were present in Sydney Harbour, the heavy cruisers USS Chicago and HMAS Canberra, and the light cruiser HMAS Adelaide, 193-94 other warships in the harbour included, destroyer tender USS Dobbin, auxiliary Minilea HMAS Bungary, corvettes HMAS Wyala, HMAS Geelong, and Miss Bombay. Armed merchant cruisers HMS Canimbla and HMAS Westralia, and Dutch submarine K9 colon 193-94 a converted ferry, HMAS Cuttable, was alongside at Garden Island where she served as a temporary barracks for sailors transferring between ships, 
143 The hospital ship Orania had also been in the harbor, but departed an hour before the attack, 190. Chapter 2 Harbor Defenses At the time of the attack, the static Sydney harbor defenses consisted of eight anti-submarine indicator loops, six outside the harbor, one between North Head and South Head, and one between South Head and Middle Head, as well as the partially constructed Sydney Harbour anti-submarine boom net between George's Head on Middle Head and Lang Point on Inner South Head, 65 192-94 The central section of the net was completed and support piles were in place to the west. But 400 metres wide gaps remained on either side, 65 193 Material shortages prevented the completion of the boom net prior to the attack, 194 On the day of the attack, the six outer indicator loops were inactive, two were not functioning and there were not enough trained personnel to man both the inner and outer loop monitoring stations, 6 177 The North Head, South Head indicator loop had been giving faulty signals since early 1940, and as civilian traffic regularly passed over the loop, readings were often ignored, 190 harbor defense craft included the anti-submarine vessels HMAS Yandra and Bingara, the auxiliary minesweepers HMAS Gunambi and Samuel Benbow, pleasure launches converted to channel patrol boats, namely HMAS Yaroma, Lolita, Steady Hour, Sea Mist, Marleyan, and Tumari, and four unarmed naval auxiliary patrol boats, 66194. Chapter 3, Prelude the Japanese Navy used five Kohayoteki class midget submarines in an unsuccessful operation against U.S. battleships during the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Navy hoped that upgrades to the submarines, intensified crew training, and the selection of a less well defended target would lead to better results and an increased chance of the crews of the midgets to return alive from their mission. 58 Therefore, on 16 December 1941, the Navy initiated plans for a second midget submarine operation, 58 The plans called for two simultaneous attacks against Allied naval vessels in the Indian and South Pacific Oceans. 59 These attacks were intended as diversions ahead of the attack on Midway Island in the North Pacific, with the Japanese hoping to convince the Allies that they intended to attack to the south or west of their conquests. 11 submarines of the 8th Submarine Squadron were to carry out the two attacks, the five submarines of the Western Attack Group in the Indian Ocean, and the six submarines of the Eastern Attack Group in the Pacific Ocean, 194 The submarine groups were to select a suitable port of attack, based on their own reconnaissance. The Western Attack Group selected the port of Diego Suarez in Madagascar, 162 This attack, which occurred at nightfall on 30 May and resulted in the damaging of the battleship HMS Ramillies and the sinking of the tanker British Loyalty, came 22 days after the British captured the port from Vichy France at the beginning of the Battle of Madagascar, 65 The four potential targets for the Eastern Attack Group were Noumea, Suva, Auckland, and Sydney. 163 Identified by reconnaissance flights conducted by Warrant Flying Officer Nobu Fujita of the Imperial Japanese Navy flying from I-25, commencing 17 February over Sydney Harbour, and the Eastern Australian harbours of Melbourne and Hobart, followed by the New Zealand harbours of Wellington and Auckland, 130-48 I-21 and I-29, were sent to select the final target, with I-29 sailing to Sydney, 65 on the evening of 16 May, I-29 fired on the 5,135 long tons Soviet merchant vessel Wellen. 30 miles from Newcastle, New South Wales, 65 Although Wellen escaped with minimal damage, shipping between Sydney and Newcastle was halted for 24 hours while aircraft and all available anti-submarine ships from Sydney, including Dutch light cruiser HNLMS Tromp, Australian destroyer HMAS Arunta and US destroyer USS Perkins, searched unsuccessfully for the submarine, 62 Muirhead Gould concluded that the submarine had operated alone, and had left the area immediately after the attack. 87 I-29's float plane made a reconnaissance flight over Sydney on 23 May. 62 A secret radar unit set up in Iron Cove detected the flight, but authorities dismissed its report as a glitch, as there were no Allied aircraft operating over Sydney, 63 to 64 the aircraft was damaged or destroyed on landing, although its two crew survived, 64 they reported the presence of several capital ships, including two battleships or large cruisers, 
five other large warships, several minor war vessels and patrol boats. And prolific merchant shipping, 170-71 the report, which the Allied Frumal Signals Intelligence Network partially intercepted, resulted in the Japanese Navy selecting Sydney as the target, 170-71-192 the three midget carrying submarines rendezvoused with I-29, and I-21 approximately 35 miles northeast of Sydney heads, with all five submarines in position by the 29th of May. 64. Chapter 4 Midget Submarine Operation. Chapter 4 Section 1, Final Reconnaissance. Before dawn on the 29th of May, I-21's float plane, piloted by Ito Susumu, 340 performed a final reconnaissance flight over Sydney Harbour, with the mission of mapping the locations of the major vessels and of the anti-submarine net, 7187 multiple observers spotted the float plane but assumed it was a US Navy Curtis Seagull, 64 189-93 no alarm was raised until 507, when it was realized that the only ship in the area carrying seagulls was the US cruiser Chicago, and all four of her aircraft were on board, 64 189-93 Richmond Air Force Base launched Wiraway fighters, which failed to locate I-21 or the float plane, 193 therefore, the reconnaissance flight did not result in the authorities in Sydney taking any special defence measures, 64 the float plane was seriously damaged on landing and had to be scuttled, but both aircrew survived, 192. Chapter 4 Section 2, Plan of Attack The Japanese planned to launch the midgets one after the other between 1720 and 1740, from points 5 to 7 nautical miles outside Sydney Harbour, 205 The first midget was to pass through the heads just after 1830, but heavy seas delayed her by over an hour, 205 The other two midgets followed at 20-minute intervals and were similarly delayed, 205 The choice of targets was left up to the midget commanders, with advice that they should primarily target aircraft carriers or battleships, with cruisers as secondary targets. The midgets were to operate to the east of the harbour bridge, although if no suitable targets were to be found in this area they were to move under the bridge and attack a battleship and large cruiser believed to be in the inner harbour. When the second reconnaissance flyover revealed that the expected British battleship, HMS War Spite, was nowhere to be found, USS Chicago became the priority target, 75, 79 after completing their mission, the midgets were to depart Sydney Harbour and head south for 20 nautical miles to the recovery point off Port Hacking, 79 four of the mother submarines would be waiting in an east-west line 16 km long, with the fifth waiting 6 km further south, 79. Chapter 4 Section 3, Attack Midget submarine M14, launched from I-27, was the first to enter Sydney Harbour, 67 the middle head, South Head Loop detected it at 20.01, but dismissed the reading due to heavy civilian traffic, 206 at 20.15, the Maritime Services Board watchman spotted the midget after it passed through the Western Gap, collided with the pile light, then reversed and trapped its stern in the net, 105 the submarine's bow broke the surface. The watchman rowed toward it to determine what it was and then rowed to the nearby patrol boat HMAS Yaroma to report his finding, 106-208 Despite efforts by Yaroma to pass on this information, Sydney Naval Headquarters did not receive the report until 2152, 208-108 HMAS Yaroma and HMAS Lolita were dispatched to investigate, 208 Upon confirming that the object in the net was a baby submarine. Lolita dropped two depth charges while Yaroma's commander requested permission from Sydney Naval Headquarters to open fire, 115-209 The depth charges failed to detonate, as the water was too shallow for the hydrostatic fuse setting, 209 at 2235, while Yaroma was waiting for permission to fire, and Lolita was setting up to deploy a third depth charge, the two crewmen on M14 activated one of the submarine's tuttling charges, killing themselves and destroying the submarine's forward section. 209-116-17 Muirhead Gould gave the general alarm, along with orders for ships to take anti-submarine measures, at 2227, the alarm was repeated at 2236 with advice for ships to take precautions against attack, 
as an enemy submarine might be in the harbour, 210-119 at the time of the first alarm, Sydney Harbour was closed to external traffic, but Muirhead Gould ordered ferries and other internal traffic to continue, as he believed that having multiple ships travelling around at speed would help force any submarines to remain submerged, 119 midget submarine M24 was the second to enter the harbour. HMAS fully grazed M24's hull and reported the contact to command. The report was not followed up. M24 crossed the indicator loop undetected at 2148, and at approximately 2200 hours followed a manly ferry through the anti-submarine net, 67210 at 2252, M24 was spotted by a Chicago searchlight operator less than 500 meters to the moored cruiser's starboard, and on a course roughly parallel to the ship's facing, 210-123 Chicago opened fire with a 5-in gun and a quadruple machine gun mount, but inflicted minimal damage as the weapons could not depress far enough. 211 Some of the 5-in shells tipped off the water and hit Fort Denison's Martello Tower, while fragments were later found in the suburbs of Cremorne and Mossman, 125 The senior officer present aboard Chicago ordered the crew to begin preparing for departure, and for USS Perkins to begin an anti-submarine screening patrol around the cruiser, orders that were revoked by the skeptical Captain Howard Bode when he arrived on board at around 23.30, 127, 133 HMAS. Wyala and Geelong also fired upon M24 as it fled west toward the Sydney Harbour Bridge, before the midget was able to submerge and escape, 212 when it returned to periscope depth, the midget found itself west of Fort Denison, 212 it turned and sailed east for about one nautical mile, then took up a firing position southwest of Bradley's head, from where its commander could see Chicago's, stern silhouetted against the construction floodlights at Garden Island's new Captain Cook graving dock. 212 to 14 midget submarine M21, from I-22, probably entered the harbor at the same time that USS Chicago opened fire on M24, 68 The unarmed naval auxiliary patrol boat Loriana spotted M21 and illuminated the submarine's conning tower, while sending an alert signal to the Port War Signal Station at South Head, and the nearby anti-submarine vessel HMAS Yandra, 68 Yandra attempted to ram the submarine, lost contact, regained contact at 2303, and fired a full pattern of six depth charges. 213 At the time of the attack, it was assumed that the depth charges had destroyed or disabled the midget, but M21 survived, 213 historians believe that the midget took refuge on the harbour floor and waited until the allied vessels had moved away before it resumed the attack, 213 at 2314, Muirhead Gould ordered all ships to observe blackout conditions, 213 to 14 just after 2330, he set off on a barge towards the boom net, to make a personal inspection. 135 The Admiral reached Lolita at about midnight and indicated to her crew that he did not take the reports of enemy submarines seriously, reportedly saying, what are you all playing at, running up and down the harbour dropping depth charges and talking about enemy subs in the harbour. There's not one to be seen, 135 The crew reiterated that a submarine had been seen, but Muirhead Gould remained unconvinced and before he left, added sarcastically, if you see another sub, see if the captain has a black beard. I'd like to meet him, 136. Despite the blackout order, the Garden Island floodlights remained on until 025, 213 to 14 about 5 minutes later, M24 fired the first of its two torpedoes, it delayed firing the second torpedo for several minutes as the midget submarines would lose longitudinal stability immediately after firing a torpedo, 214 historians are divided as to the exact paths of the torpedoes relative to Chicago, although all agree, that the US cruiser was the intended target. Both torpedoes missed Chicago, while one torpedo may have also passed close to Perkins' starboard bow, 139 One of the torpedoes continued underneath the Dutch submarine K-9 and HMAS Cuttable, then hit the breakwater Cuttable was tied up against, 139 The explosion broke Cuttable in two and sank her, and damaged K-9 colon 143-215 The attack killed 19 Royal Australian Navy and two Royal Navy sailors, and wounded another 10. 
The explosion shook residences in the area and damaged garden islands lights and telecommunications, 215 The other torpedo ran aground on the eastern shore of Garden Island without exploding, 215 M24 then dived and moved to leave the harbor, 216. A crossing over the indicator loop that was recorded at 158 was initially believed to be another midget submarine entering the harbor, although later analysis showed that the reading indicated an outbound vessel and was therefore most likely represented M24's exit, 70 M24 did not return to its mother submarine, and its fate remained unknown until 2006, 189 ships were ordered to make for the open ocean. Chicago left her anchorage at 214, leaving a sailor behind on the mooring buoy in her haste to depart, 216 Bombay, Wyala, Canberra, and Perkins began their preparations to depart, 153 to 54 just before 3 o'clock, as Chicago was leaving the harbor, the lookout spotted a submarine periscope, passing alongside the cruiser, 218 at 301, the indicator loop registered an inbound signal, M21 was re-entering Sydney Harbor after recovering from the attack four hours previously. 218 HMS Canimbla fired on M21 in Neutral Bay at 350, and at 5 o'clock, three auxiliary patrol boats, HMAS Steady Hour, Sea Mist, and Yaroma, spotted the submarine's conning tower in Taylor's Bay, 218 the patrol boats had set their depth charge fuses to 15 meters, and when Sea Mist passed over where the submarine had just submerged and dropped a depth charge, she had only 5 seconds to clear the area, 218 the blast damaged M21, which inverted and rose to the surface before sinking again. 219 Sea Mist dropped a second depth charge, which damaged one of her two engines in the process and prevented her from making further attacks. 219 Steady Hour and Yaroma continued the attack, dropping 17 depth charges on believed visual sightings and instrument contacts of the midget over the next three and a half hours. 219 At some point during the night, the crew of M21 killed themselves. 219 At 4.40, HMAS Canberra recorded that the Japanese may have fired torpedoes at her. 160-62 This may have been one of many false alarms throughout the night. However, M21 had attempted to fire its two torpedoes, but failed because of damage to the bow either from HMAS Yandra's ramming or depth charges, or a possible collision with USS Chicago, making it possible that M21 attempted to attack the cruiser. 160-62 The observer aboard Canberra may have seen bubbles from the compressed air released, to fire the torpedoes, 160-62. Chapter 5, Secondary Missions As per the operation plan, the five mother submarines waited off port hacking on the nights of 1 and the 2nd of June for the midget submarines to return, 225-188-89 Frumal picked up wireless traffic between the five submarines, leading the Royal Australian Air Force to task three Lockheed Hudsons and two Bristol Beauforts with finding the source of the communications, 225 they were unsuccessful, 225 on the 3rd of June, Sasaki abandoned hope of recovering the midget submarines, and the submarines dispersed on their secondary missions, 189. Chapter 5 Section 1, Attacks on Allied Merchant Shipping Four of the submarines began operations against Allied merchant shipping. I-21 patrolled north of Sydney, while I-24 patrolled south of Sydney, 239 I-27 began searching off Gabo Island for ships departing Melbourne, and I-29 travelled to Brisbane, 239 I-22 left the group to conduct reconnaissance operations, first at Wellington and Auckland in New Zealand, and then at Suva in Fiji. 239 between 1 and 25 June, when the four submarines arrived at Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands to resupply before proceeding to Japanese shipyards for maintenance. The four submarines attacked at least seven Allied merchant vessels, 254 three of these were sunk, Iron Chieftain by I-24 on 3 June, Iron Crown by I-27 on 4 June, and Guatemala by I-21 on 12 June. 241, 244, 253 The first two attacks resulted in 12 and 37 fatalities respectively, though the third attack killed no one, 191, 193, 
199 The attacks forced the authorities to institute changes in merchant traffic. Travel north of Melbourne was restricted until a system of escorted convoys was established. 195 I-21 was the only submarine to return to Australian waters, where she sank three ships and damaged two others during January and February 1943, 254, 260-61 during her two deployments. I-21 sank 44,000 long tons of Allied shipping, which made her the most successful Japanese submarine to operate in Australian waters. Chapter 5 Section 2 Bombardment. On the morning of 8 June, I-24 and I-21 briefly bombarded Sydney and Newcastle, 194 just after midnight, I-24 surfaced 9 miles south-southeast of Macquarie Lighthouse, 247 The submarine's commander ordered the gun crew to target the Sydney Harbour Bridge, 247 They fired 10 shells over a 4-minute period, 9 landed in the eastern suburbs and 1 landed in water, 248 I-24 then crash dived to prevent successful retaliation by coastal artillery batteries, 248 to 49 only one shell detonated. And the only injuries inflicted were cuts and fractures from falling bricks or broken glass when the unexploded shells hit buildings, 249 a United States Army Air Forces pilot, 1st Lieutenant George Cantello, based at Bankstown Airport disobeyed orders and took off to try and locate the source of the shelling but was killed when engine failure caused his Aero Cobra to crash in a paddock at Hammondville. In 1988, following efforts by residents and the U.S. consulate in Sydney, the city of Liverpool established a memorial park, the Lieutenant Cantello Reserve, with a monument in his honour. At 2.15, I-21 shelled Newcastle, from 9 kilometres northeast of Stockton Beach, 250 she fired 34 shells over a 16-minute period, including 8 star shells, 250 The target of the attack was the BHP steelworks in the city, 197 However, the shells landed over a large area, causing minimal damage and no fatalities. The only shell to detonate damaged a house on Parnell Place, while an unexploded shell hit a tram terminus, 197-251 Fort Scratchley returned fire, the only time an Australian land fortification has fired on an enemy warship during wartime but the submarine escaped unscathed, 251. Chapter 6, Analysis The attack on Sydney Harbour ended in failure on both sides, and revealed flaws in both the Allied defences and the Japanese tactics. During the primary attack, the Japanese lost all three midget submarines in exchange for the sinking of a single barracks ship. The subsequent operations were no more successful as the five large Japanese submarines sank only three merchant ships and caused minimal property damage during the two bombardments. The performance of the Allied defenders was equally poor. However, one historian states that the lack of damage in Sydney Harbour was due to a combination of good luck and aggressive counterattack. 74 The main impact of the midget submarine attack and subsequent operations was psychological, dispelling any belief that Sydney was immune to Japanese attack and highlighting Australia's proximity to the Pacific War. 225 74 There was no official inquiry into the attacks, despite demand from some sections of the media. As there was concern that an inquiry would lead to defeatism and reduce faith in John Curtin's government, particularly after the damaging inquiry into Australian defences that had followed the Japanese aerial attack on Darwin three months earlier, 169-176. Chapter 6, Section 1, Failures in Allied Defences The Allies failed to respond adequately to several warnings of Japanese activity off the east coast of Australia prior to the attack, they simply ignored the warnings or explained them away. They attributed the unsuccessful attack on the freighter Wellen on 16 May to a single submarine, and assumed it had departed Australian waters immediately after the attack, 174 The first reconnaissance flight went unnoticed, and although Frumel intercepted the report and distributed it to Allied commanders on 30 May, Muirhead Gould apparently did not react, 170-71 New Zealand naval authorities detected radio chatter between the Japanese submarines on 26 and 29 May. And although they could not decrypt the transmissions, radio direction finding indicated that a submarine or submarines were approaching Sydney, 
174 The Allies considered dispatching an anti-submarine patrol in response to the 29th of May fix, but were unable to do so as all anti-submarine craft were already committed to protecting a northbound troop convoy, 192 The only response to the second reconnaissance flight on the 29th of May was the launching of search planes. 193 No other defense measures were put into place, 193 Although the midget attack on Diego Suarez in Madagascar occurred on the morning of 31 May, the Allies sent no alert to other command regions, as they believed that Vichy French forces had launched the attack, 198. Historians have questioned the competence of the senior Allied officers. Muirhead Gould had been hosting a dinner party on the night of the attack, and one of the main guests was the senior United States Navy officer in Sydney Harbor, Captain Howard Bode of USS Chicago, 87 Both officers were skeptical that any attack was taking place, 135 Muirhead Gould arrived aboard HMAS Lolita at approximately midnight, an action he described as attempting to learn about the situation. But members of Lolita's crew later recounted that when Muirhead Gould came aboard he immediately chastised the patrol boat's skipper and crew, and quickly dismissed their report, 135-136 junior officers on Chicago provided similar descriptions of Bode's return on board, and members of both crews later claimed that Muirhead Gould and Bode were intoxicated, 133-35 It was only after the destruction of HMAS Cuttable that both officers began to take the attack seriously, 142-43 during the attack. There were several delays between events and responses to them. Over two hours passed between the observation of M14 in the boom net and Muirhead Gould's first order for ships to commence anti-submarine actions, 72 it took another two hours to mobilize the auxiliary patrol boats, which did not leave their anchorage for a further hour, 72 part of these delays was due to a lack of effective communications, 73 none of the auxiliary patrol craft in the harbor had radio communications. So all instructions and reports came from signal lights via the Port War Signal Station or Garden Island, or by physical communication via launches, 73176 in Muirhead Gould's preliminary report on the attack, he stated that the Port War Signal Station was not designed for the volume of communications traffic the attack caused. Telephone communications with Garden Island were unreliable during the early part of the attack, and then the first torpedo explosion disabled them completely, 211.73 The need to keep information secret may also have contributed to the delays and the defenders' skepticism, 194-95 As the auxiliary patrol boat crews, the indicator loop staff, and other personnel manning defensive positions would have been outside need to know and would not have been informed about any of the incidents prior to the attack, they would not have been alert, contributing to the disbelief demonstrated in the early hours of the attack, 194-95. Chapter 6, Section 2, Flaws in Japanese Tactics The main flaw in the Japanese plans was the use of midget submarines for the primary attack. Midget submarines were originally intended to operate during fleet actions, they would be released from modified seaplane carriers to run amok through the enemy fleet, 68 This concept went out of favor as changing Japanese naval thinking and experience led to recognition that naval warfare would center around carrier-supported aerial combat, 71 As a result, the midget program's focus changed to the infiltration of enemy harbors, where they would attack vessels at anchor. 71 This concept failed completely during the attack on Pearl Harbor, where the midgets had no effect, and tying up 11 large submarines for six weeks in support of further midget submarine attacks on Sydney and Diego Suarez proved a waste of resources, 58-291 Moreover, the failures at Sydney Harbour and Diego Suarez demonstrated that the improvements to the midget submarines made after Pearl Harbour had not increased the overall impact of the midget program. 58-291 The modifications had various effects. The ability to man and deploy the midgets while the mother ships were submerged prevented the Army coastal radars from detecting the mother submarines, 188 however, the midgets were still difficult to control, unstable, and prone to surfacing or diving uncontrollably, 70 these maneuverability issues contributed to M14's entanglement in the anti-submarine net, and the repeated detection of M21 and M24. 
Beyond the use of the unreliable midgets, historians have identified areas in the plan of attack where the Japanese could have done significantly more damage. If the Japanese midget submarines had conducted a simultaneous, coordinated attack, they would have overwhelmed the defenses, 188 a chance for more damage came following the destruction of Cuttable, when several naval vessels headed to sea, including USS Chicago, USS Perkins, Dutch submarine K-9, HMAS Wyala, and Miss Bombay, 70 the five mother submarines were already en route to the port hacking recovery position. And although Sasaki's plan at Pearl Harbor had been to leave some submarines at the harbor mouth to pick off fleeing vessels, he did not repeat this tactic, 155. Chapter 6 Section 3, USS Chicago's Survival Several factors beyond the control of any of the combatants contributed to the survival of USS Chicago. At the time of M24's attack on Chicago, the latter had spent some time preparing to depart from Sydney Harbour, and although still moored and stationary, was producing large volumes of white smoke as the boilers warmed up, 137 this smoke, streaming aft under the influence of the wind, and contrasting against the dark, low-lying cloud, may have given the impression that Chicago was moving, causing M24 to lead the target when firing its torpedoes, and consequently sending its torpedoes across the bow. 137 to 39 Another factor that may have influenced Chicago's survival, was the extinguishing of Garden Island's floodlights minutes before M24 fired its first torpedo, impeding targeting, 73. Chapter 6, Section 4, Bombardment Impact The bombardments failed to cause significant physical damage, but had a major psychological impact on the residents of Sydney and Newcastle. Due to the inaccuracy of the submarine's range-finding equipment, coupled with the unstable firing platform of a submarine at sea, specific targeting was impossible, 250 The intention of the submarine bombardment was to frighten the population of the target area, 250 The failure of the majority of the shells to detonate may have had various causes. As the submarines fired armor-piercing shells, intended for use against steel ship hulls, the relatively softer brick walls may have failed to trigger the impact fuses, 249 sea water may have degraded the shells, which the Japanese had stored in deck lockers for several weeks, 249 the age of the shells may also have been a factor, some of the shells recovered from the Newcastle bombardment were found to be of English manufacture, surplus munitions from World War I. 197 in Sydney. Fear of an impending Japanese invasion caused people to move west, Housing prices in the eastern suburbs dropped, while those beyond the Blue Mountains rose significantly, 258 the attack also led to a significant increase in the membership of volunteer defence organisations, and strengthening of defences in Sydney Harbour and Port Newcastle. Chapter 7, Aftermath The papers did not publish news of the submarine attack until 2 June, as most of the attack occurred after the newspapers went to press on the morning of the 1st of June. 225 instead, on the morning after the attack, the front pages carried news of Operation Millennium, the Royal Air Force's first 1000 bomber raid, although several newspapers included a small interior article mentioning the final reconnaissance flyover, 225 the federal censor ordered total censorship of the events. Issuing an official statement on the afternoon of the 1st of June which reported that the Allies had destroyed three submarines in Sydney Harbour, and described the loss of Cuttable and the 21 deaths as the loss of one small harbour vessel of no military value, 156, 187 Smiths Weekly finally released the real story on the 6th of June, and follow-up material in 13 June issue caused more political damage prompting the Royal Australian Navy to attempt to charge the newspaper with releasing defence information. 212, 223-27 It was several days before the 21 dead sailors aboard Cuttable could all be recovered, 151 on 3 June, Muirhead Gould and over 200 Navy personnel attended a burial ceremony for these sailors, 151 on 1 January 1943, 
The Navy base at Garden Island was commissioned as HMAS Cuttable in commemoration of the ferry and the lives lost. The Australians recovered the bodies of the four Japanese crew of the two midget submarines sunk in Sydney Harbour and had them cremated at Eastern Suburbs Crematorium. For the cremation, the Allies draped the Japanese flag over each coffin and rendered full naval honours. 72 Muirhead Gould was criticised for this, but defended his actions as respecting the courage of the four submariners, regardless of their origin. 230 Australian politicians also hoped that the Japanese government would notice the respect paid to the sailors and improve the conditions Australian prisoners of war were experiencing in Japanese internment camps. 231 Japanese authorities noted the funeral service, but this did not lead to any major improvement in conditions for Australian POWs. 231 Following the use of the midget submariner's funeral by the Japanese for propaganda purposes, the Australian High Command forbade similar funerals for enemy personnel in the future. An exchange of Japanese and Allied diplomatic personnel stranded in the opposing nations occurred in August 1942, which allowed Tatsuo Kawai, the Japanese ambassador to Australia, to return home with the ashes of the four Japanese submariners, 232-33 when the exchange ship Kamakura Maro arrived in Yokohama, several thousand people were present to honour the four men, 232-33. The two main targets of the attack, USS Chicago and HMAS Canberra, were both lost within the next year. Canberra sinking on 9 August 1942 during the Battle of Savo Island, and Chicago on 30 January 1943 following the Battle of Rennell Island, 61, 150-53, 273 None of the Japanese submarines involved in the attack survived the war. USS Charette and Fair sank at 21 on 5 February 1944 off the Marshall Islands, 216 An American torpedo boat sank I-22 on 25 December 1942 off New Guinea, 216 An American patrol craft sank I-24 on 10 June 1943 near the Aleutian Islands, 216 HMS Paladin and Petard sank I-27 on 12 February 1943 off the Maldives, 216 Lastly, USS Sawfish sank I-29 on 26 July 1944 in the Philippines, 216. Chapter 7 Section 1, M14 and M21 The Allies located and recovered M21 on 3 June and M14 on 8 June. 209, 219 Although both were damaged, during the attack, it was possible to assemble a complete submarine from the two vessels, 72 The center section of the rebuilt submarine was mounted on a trailer and taken on a 4,000 km tour throughout southern New South Wales, Victoria, and western South Australia, 72 250 The purpose of the tour was twofold, it allowed Australians to see a Japanese midget submarine up close, and was used to raise a pound 28,000 for the Naval Relief Fund and other charities. 72 The submarine arrived at the Australian War Memorial in Canberra on 28 April 1943, flying the White Ensign and a paying-off pennant. 72 The submarine was originally displayed outside the museum in three separate pieces, 251 but was moved inside in the 1980s due to heavy vandalism, on one occasion in 1966, a group of university students painted it bright yellow in response to the Beatles's song Yellow Submarine. 253-55 The composite submarine was restored and remains on display inside the memorial as part of a permanent exhibition on the attack, next to the recovered wheelhouse of HMAS Cuttable, 253-55 The conning tower from M21 is on display at the Royal Australian Navy Heritage Centre on Garden Island, 251 Leftover material from M21 was melted down and, and made into souvenirs following the construction of the combined vessel. 253. Chapter 7 Section 2, M24 Over the 64 years following the disappearance of M24 after the attacks, more than 50 people approached the Royal Australian Navy claiming to have found the submarine. All of these claims were found to be false. One early theory about the midget's fate was that it was damaged or destroyed, along with M21, in or around Taylor's Bay which would account for reports from Steady Hour and Yarom of multiple submarines during their three-hour attack against M21, 
71217 A second theory was that the midget attempted to return to the mother submarines but exhausted its battery power before reaching the port hacking recovery point and would therefore be outside and to the south of Sydney Heads. 217 The third theory was that the midget's crew decided to avoid endangering the five larger submarines during the recovery process, and either ran straight out to sea or headed north. 184 A group of seven amateur scuba divers solved the mystery in November 2006, when they found a small submarine sitting upright on the seabed, 55 meters below sea level and approximately 5 kilometers from Bungan Head, off Sydney's northern beaches. Commander Shane Moore, the officer responsible for the Royal Australian Navy's Heritage Collection, confirmed that the wreck was M24 after viewing footage from multiple dives, along with measurements the group had taken. The wreck had several bullet holes in it, most likely from Chicago's quadruple machine gun mount. The location of the wreck was kept secret by both the divers and the Navy, with Defense Minister Brendan Nelson promising to have the wreck protected as a war grave. The wreck was gazetted on 1 December 2006 as a heritage site. A 500 meters exclusion zone was established around the wreck site, and any vessel entering the zone is liable to a fine under New South Wales law of up to 1.1 million Australian dollars, with additional fines and confiscation of equipment under Commonwealth law. 255 Sure and Boy mounted surveillance cameras and a sonar listening device further protect the site. 255 On the 7th of February 2007, during JMSDF Admiral Eiji Yoshikawa's visit to Australia. Yoshikawa and RAN Vice Admiral Russ Shalders presided over a ceremony held aboard HMAS Newcastle to honor M24's crew. Relatives of the midget submarine's crews, one of the survivors from Cuttable, and dignitaries and military personnel from Australia, and Japan attended another ceremony on 6 August 2007 at HMAS Cuttable. HMAS Melbourne then carried relatives of M24's crew to the wreck site, where they poured sake into the sea before being presented with sand taken from the seabed around the submarine dot in May 2012, the NSW state government announced that, with the approval of the Japanese government and the submariners' families, divers would be allowed to observe the M24 wreck for a short period of time. Divers would enter a ballot for places on controlled dives run on several days. If successful, opening the site would become an annual event to commemorate the attack.